This is CBC Here and Now. Well, um, I deserve to die and burn in hell. I had someone tell me that um, my children should be orphans. You have to look at also the harm that has been done to our 32 members over the last 21 and a half months. Calling out scab workers, Unifor isn't backing down after an avalanche of criticism over this video targeting replacement workers at a company in Gander. Employees at DJ Composites in Gander have been on the picket line for nearly two years. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. And I'm Jeremy Eaton. Tensions at a Gander picket line are ramping up. A union representing locked out workers took aim at their replacements last week. It happened online in a video on social media. Now workers at DJ Composites in Gander have been on strike for almost two years and the company has hired replacement workers. Now here now is Garrett Berry is live in our Gander newsroom tonight. Garrett, what can you tell us about all this? Well, what you're seeing right next to me is one piece of this video. The video starts, by the way, with Meet the Scabs. And this is a photo in, of Ada Mae Rogers, one of the replacement workers. You can see her face here. You can see her name clearly in this video, which has been seen more than 100,000 times. My first reaction was instant fear because I seen that my name and my face was out there and it wasn't just local anymore. For two months, Rogers has been crossing this picket line, a replacement worker at DJ Composites. I got to make a living just like anybody else. Last week, she and her co-workers were named in this video posted to Unifor's page. Now the Facebook messages are coming in. I've been getting messages from people Canada-wide from one side to the other saying, you shouldn't be doing this, you're a scab, you don't deserve to live. Um, every day there's new messages there guaranteed. They want that video taken down. Unifor says it doesn't support any threatening messages, but it isn't backing away. And on the picket line? Oh, we're ecstatic about it because at least now that we're back into the media. Names and pictures on these signs too. Uh, they, they think that we're bullying them, but we feel like they're bullying us because if it wasn't for them, we'd probably be able to uh, have a contract negotiated and be already back in the building. Do you feel like what you're doing is taking away from someone else? I really don't. No? I don't because I'm not helping produce more. I'm just helping them barely get by. I, I'm not that big of an asset to the company in that sense. Glover says in a contract dispute this long, this is fair. When they went into the building, they knew there was a lockout. They knew on the first day that when they crossed the picket line that they were going to be known as scabs. They posted on their Facebook they were working for DJ Composites. It's clear there's no love lost between these sides. I, I kind of felt for them before, before they started bullying and harassing. But now it's to the point of no return. Now, as we mentioned, this contract dispute between the union and DJ Composites is a long run. It's been more than 600 days now without a contract. The union has been asking Premier Dwight Ball to step in, and today the Premier did respond to some questions about this dispute. Right now, I am not going to react or respond to how any group would actually, they would see the whatever technique that they, wanna, they want to use when it comes to getting people back to the table. The only technique that I want to see is get back to the table and find a way to get a negotiated settlement. As for the replacement workers that we spoke to today, they say they are not going to be shamed out of their workplace and the union should be focused on management, not them. Reporting live for Here Now, I'm Garrett Berry in Gander. Well, meanwhile, Unifor's Atlantic Regional Director isn't backing down. She says nobody should be threatening scab workers, but people should look at the harm they're doing to the members locked out of work. And as for the Premier's comments that the union needs to come to the table. Oh, for God's sakes, what does he think the union has been doing for 21 and a half months? We are the only ones bargaining. You need to have somebody on the other side who's going to bargain fairly. Right now, the complete balance of labor relations has been thrown out of whack because the employer 
can break the law and not have to face any consequences. A 25-year-old man is in custody after an incident that prompted police to draw their weapons today. At around 6 o'clock this morning, police were called to Kennedy Road, which is off Topsail Road. Officers had their guns drawn, and they appeared to be negotiating with a man through a basement window. Roughly four hours later, those guns were put down, and medical workers were allowed to enter the home. A man was escorted out and into an ambulance shortly after. Police say charges, including weapon-related offenses, will follow. That was the big red flag when the people upstairs said, I don't know what you're talking about. That was my big, my big, my heart just sank. Among students from Ontario arrived in St. John's to find the room she rented was already rented out. That story from CBC Investigates just ahead. More big developments today in the plan to establish a massive aquaculture project on the Buren Peninsula and in Placentia Bay. The provincial government is ready to jump in with both feet. And the company behind the project say it says it's full steam ahead, which means hundreds of jobs for a hard-hit part of the province. Terry Roberts has been following that story today, and he joins us live now with the latest. Terry? Uh, yeah, Jeremy, well, it looks like any doubts that the Greek Canal project would go ahead, well, that can be put aside. And as for taxpayers, well, it looks like we are getting into the aquaculture business. Now that the environmental assessment process has been cleared, expect to see the earth start to move in Marystown very soon. We plan to be a significant partner in this project. It started with this commitment from the Premier this morning, and then this from a company spokesman. Yes, full steam ahead. Our ownership are ready to go. They're, they're extremely pleased that we're finally at this point. A $250 million investment. A massive hatchery in Marystown at the centre of it all. About two years to build. We're looking forward to the point where we'll be able to, uh, to start up and we're anticipating that we'll be within a very short period of time. And up to 72 sea cages like these in Placentia Bay eventually producing 33,000 metric tons of salmon. The company says they're escape-proof, the potential for disease dramatically reduced. When it comes to diseases, because we only have one winter at sea, we're decreasing the amount of time in sea, so that's reducing the, the potential for the fish to get diseases. And the job numbers are big, 700 direct, about 2,000 when you count spin-offs. So the province is on board. The Premier making a commitment just days after the Grieg NL project cleared the environmental assessment process, ending several years of uncertainty as the company fought off court challenges and critics who say the project would be bad for the environment. The previous PC government pledged $45 million for the project, but Dwight Ball says his government won't go that far. There's uh, quite a bit of provincial money that will go into this, and this is really about the economic activity that would be generated under the Bureau Peninsula. A big announcement coming as early as this week. We've been in conversation with them, and, and all indications are that that's forthcoming. Uh, now, it'll take about uh, six years for Grieg to reach its uh, full peak production, and that's after the hatchery is completed. And that's when the benefits will really kick in for another Buren Peninsula community, St. Lawrence. I was told today that the Ocean Choice International plant in that community will be used to process all that fish. Uh, you know, creating about 120 year-round jobs. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Terry Roberts in St. John's. The federal and provincial governments have signed a new 10-year agreement that will see more than half a billion dollars spent in the province. The deal includes more than $500 million for infrastructure projects over the decade. Here's the breakdown. There's $300 million for projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, nearly $110 million for new urban transit networks and service extensions, and just over $100 million for projects to improve the quality of life in rural and northern communities by responding to their specific needs, and $40 million for community, cultural, and recreational infrastructure projects. Every day that you get to come to St. John's to announce hundreds of millions to improve the lives of peoples and communities. This is historic in that sense that today's an investment in people. Infrastructure is about people. It's not only about bridges and roads and, and wastewater treatment. It's about improving the quality of life of people. The search for a man who went missing in the ocean off Tilting on Fogo Island 
has ended, with police saying they found no sign of the 54-year-old. He was visiting from Ontario, and last Thursday he went for a swim in an area called Greenpoint. The search was extensive. It included ground crews, aircraft vessels, and an under underwater recovery team. And the search has ended for a German pop star who reportedly jumped off of a cruise ship en route to St. John's. The Aida Luna called the Canadian Coast Guard for help around 6 o'clock Sunday morning. A search ensued but was called off earlier today. The 33-year-old who went overboard was a contestant on Germany's version of Pop Idol 15 years ago. The cruise line says he jumped. After the incident, the ship skipped St. John's and is now on its way to New York. The RCMP will be taking over the file as it is now a missing persons case. Well, a clear night in the province with a risk of frost for most of the island. Another bright and sunshiny day coming tomorrow with temperatures in the upper teens for most places. I'll break it all down for you coming up. Tonight on CBC Investigates, a Memorial University student from Ontario got quite the shock when she arrived to start the school year. Two weeks ago, she drove up and knocked on the door of what she thought was her new home. But instead, she was met with puzzled looks from the people living there. Now, here and now's Jen White has been following this story, and she joins us live from our newsroom. So, Jen, what happened? Well, Jeremy, Elaine Searle had originally re rented a room in a house and was all set to start the fall semester, but those plans fell through in mid-August, just two weeks ago, just before she was due to arrive here in St. John's. So the pressure was on. Elaine Searle was left scrambling to find a new place. That's when she saw an ad for a basement apartment on Kijiji. Earl started emailing with the landlord. Talked to them for a couple days. I asked tons of questions. They had all the answers. And even my parents both had looked at the ad. Like it wasn't just myself. Um, both of them agreed that it was a good idea. Earl paid $380, the first month's rent without utilities, as a deposit. She drove across Ontario and arrived in St. John's five days later. She says everything seemed in order until she knocked on the door of what she thought was her new home. When the people upstairs said, I don't know what you're talking about, that was my big, my big, my heart just sank and I thought, this is it, I, I don't have anywhere to live. Searle says she was devastated. She got back in her car, called her parents and started to cry. It was hard to call my parents and say, you know, I, that I can't do it by myself um, and that I needed help. And knowing that, you know, I've got to pay for tuition and all this other stuff, then you're panicking about, you know, trying to find somewhere else to live and that I don't know if I have enough money budgeted right away and can I afford to go, you know, stay in a hotel and stuff until I've set myself up. Searle called a friend and hung out at his place until she could figure out what to do next. I felt really stupid. Um, I felt like I was an idiot and luckily the RNC took me very seriously um, when I went in to talk to them. It isn't uncommon for us to receive reports of individuals who've uh, been fraudulently um, taken advantage of through sites like Kijiji. Constable Jeff Higdon couldn't go into detail about this case, but he confirmed that the RNC is investigating. He says there are things people can do to protect themselves when looking for rentals online. Find a trusted source or ask for references. A lot of uh, landlords will actually ask for references from potential tenants, but tenants could also ask for a reference from a landlord as well. Asking for identification uh, and verifying that the person who you're dealing with is in fact, uh, you know, legally who they say they are, um, as well as maybe providing some proof that they are uh, legally entitled uh, to that property. And if something doesn't feel right, just walk away from it and find the product or service somewhere else. So there is a happy ending to Elaine Searle's story. Just hours after this whole ordeal happened, she did find a new place to live. And she says while $380 is a chunk of change to lose for a student, she says she's really lucky that she didn't lose more than that in the terms of a damage deposit or first and last month's rent. Jen, this isn't the first rental scam that we've ever heard of in the city recently, is it? Yeah, that's right, Jeremy. I reported on a case just a couple of weeks ago. A property management company in St. John's had received complaints from five people. Crown Property Management said a man was posing as the landlord of one of its rental units. He did multiple viewings and then collected money from the potential renters as deposits. Now the RNC says it has received nine complaints in that case. We do have a suspect. Uh, and the investigation is ongoing. 
Um, there's very little that we can do in terms of offering advice on how people can protect themselves. Um, in most of the cases we've seen with this one is that it wasn't a matter of the victims being, you know, doing something negligent. They did their homework, they did their best, um, you know, they did, did their best to pre prevent them this from happening. Um, but this individual, of course, presented themselves falsely and, uh, and unfortunately this happened. Now, Higdon says this type of scam is not common here in the city. And although the RNC has seen a spike in cases over the last few weeks, weeks Higdon considers it an isolated incident. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jen White in St. John's. Okay, 16 times 13. Oh, my goodness. Fractions and decimals, percents. Oh, my. I decided to come to the math department to take their placement tests, and I realized that I'm not very good at math, but I did learn a lot. I'll have that story coming up. There was a uh, bagpiper in downtown St. John's. It's a sunny but chilly day here in the city. Carolyn, Carolyn Stokes will have your forecast coming up. Welcome back to Here and Now. Let's call a spade a spade. Math, math isn't easy for everyone, and I'm a prime example. 
So last week I let a little personal information slip. Just take a look at this. These are a lot more excited than I ever was about going math? back to school. Oh, oh, he's about going back to school. I, I failed high school math, but don't yeah, tell don't me. Don't say that. Oh, sorry. School is great. That's learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I posted that clip online and the math and stats group at Memorial University reached out to me and said, you know, if you're looking for a little help, give us a call, let us know. So what I did today is I, uh, me and cameraman Gary Locke, we walked across the street. We went to the math center to speak to people who know a lot more about math than I ever will. Hey, it's September. There's lots of uh, people doing first year math. What do you see from these students? Are they scared, frightened, or how are they feeling about math? Well, well, some of them are scared, for sure. Some of them are just sort of overwhelmed about the uh, entire university experience. Uh, math is one aspect of it, but not the, certainly the only one. Uh, people are going to be struggling a lot with uh, attending classes regularly, sometimes uh, being away from home for the first time. But there is help here in the Department of Mathematics. What sort of things do you uh, people here do to try to help out students who are, uh, you know, may find math a little bit difficult like I do. Well, we try to make sure that we have an excellent group of first year instructors uh, and luckily the math department takes care of that one. There is a fantastic uh, collection of instructors that uh, many people have benefited from over the years. Uh, besides that, we have a couple of math help centers which are set up to help uh, all first year students. Uh, professors always have office hours for every class they teach uh, and many profs just love to have someone come up at the very end of class and uh, you know if you are a little bit nervous just ask a question then. I never knew the Math Help Center existed until today. <laughs> Sorry, I have an arts degree. Uh, how does it work? Can they just people just come in and say, I don't understand this? Or, or how does the Math Help Center, which we're sitting in, how does that work, Danny? That is exactly it. Students can come in and say, uh, they can be really specific. They can come in and say, I I'm working on assignment number seven. Uh, I don't understand how to do problem number three. Or they can just come in and say, I am lost. And I don't understand what's happening. You're dealing with functions that are always in terms of one variable, right? One of the best programs that we have, especially for our first year students, uh, so many students are coming from international or they're coming from around the bay or wherever they're coming from, they all have anxiety about coming to university, they've got anxiety and uh, stress about going to all their classes and everything, so we're trying to provide them with a, uh, an outlet where they can come and, and seek help anytime that they want and talk about any of their issues that they might be having with classes and everything, so it's an incredibly important program. And we just get 2x, wonderful. And there you go, you've done the derivative with the definition of the derivative. Usually the first thing that happens is they walk in and they kind of look around like they don't know even what to do, who to approach or anything like that. So I try and uh, nab those people as quickly as possible. Just get talking to them. And then uh, basically the first thing that they ask is, um, I don't understand, uh, can you help me with this? Something like that, right? And I usually ask them, well, what have you done, right? Um, a lot of students will come in and they don't have anything, they don't have anything with them, they don't have any paper. So I try to start talking to these students about what they can do to become successful in their schooling and in their academic career and also to help them with understanding their math courses. Did you ever have any struggles with mathematics? Oh, uh, I continue to have, to have many struggles. As a professional mathematician, in some sense, I, I work all day on problems that no one knows the answer to. And so uh, I do that all the time. But, but even back when I was starting off, I mean, I was a, a, a good math student. But when I took my uh, Calculus two course, which is the course I'm teaching this semester, uh, when I wrote my first midterm, I got, I got 50 on the nose. It, it knocked me back on my heels. I didn't know. You know, this is one of these existential crises. What am I going to do with the rest of my life? But I realized that sort of being good at math wasn't enough anymore, and that it was time to actually start to do some work in the thing that I loved. Uh, once I did that, things came together for me. You know, I could go talk to uh, people like my professor, who you know, who who knows all the answers, uh, and he was more than happy to stop and talk to me and explain things to me. When I did around a million problems. Well, all of a sudden, like the million and first problem gets a lot easier. Holy moly. Three equals, oh God. Uh, I think I need help. <laughs> <laughs> I can help with that. Oh, and, and help he did. He actually sat down and we went over a couple of problems and uh, he talked me through it and it was, uh, it was very helpful. Oh, that was a very yeah. brave.
great thing to do. Jeremy? Ooh, yes. How did you do on this test? Well, so the test is, it's like a placement test to figure out where, where you belong in the math world, and it's 100 multiple choice questions, but you're not allowed to use a calculator. So you get scrap paper. So I did a couple of them, and I did terrible. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we got decimals, percentages, out orders of operation, but uh, the folks oh. there at the help center, any students who are watching, if you need help, go there. They even helped me. Oh, so I... maybe I would have passed high school math if I had Danny with me. Who's to say? <laughs> well, I think a lot of people can uh, relate to your struggles, and I know I'm looking at this test, and this is just filling me with anxiety. It's, it's not easy. Hard thing. It's, it's not, not easy. easy. So, And it was interesting to hear that the professor himself got, uh, 50. got a 50. So there you he go. He has a PhD in math, too. Yeah. Just saying. Well, Jeremy, I don't have a gold star for you, but <laughs> oh. I do have a few rainbows. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, well, I got a few photos of rainbows uh, from viewers, so I thought I'd show them off to start off the weather forecast. This is from Corey Williams. This is the Belle Island area. And then I got another one from Glenn Carey. That's La Manche. And Whoa. Uh, he said that uh, hundreds of people pulled off on the highway and got out their phones to take a picture of, of this rainbow. That was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, so there you go. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> well, now let's have a look at uh, the forecast. Today was lovely. It was a little bit chillier, but uh, tomorrow is uh, going to be another really nice day. Pretty much the entire uh, island is looking at some uh, sunshine. Uh, as for current temperatures right now, 13 degrees in St. John, still fairly warm in central areas, 18 degrees in Badger right now. We do have a frost advisory in effect. I'm so sorry. <laughs> From Deer Lake over to Bonavista, Burgio, Conegra, and all the places in between looking at frost tonight. But uh, the east is also looking at a risk of frost. So we may not have an advisory in place, but we're not out of the woods. There is a risk of frost for uh, the Avalon Peninsula and for Buren. So you can see how clear things are on the island tonight, and that's partly why there is a risk of frost. We don't have those clouds as the nice warm blanket uh, to keep everything nice and cozy overnight tonight. So yeah, there it is, that risk of frost for the east. But I guess you could say more of a risk of frost for the central areas. Overnight lows on the island looking between 6 and 11 degrees for Labrador, 7 to 10 degrees and fairly breezy along the coast there. We have some westerly winds, 30 gusting to 50 there. So tomorrow we're looking at another really nice day. You can see a, a little bit of cloud cover, but overall we're looking at a very sunny day for pretty much everybody. So in St. John's, temperatures looking great. 19 degrees as the high, that nice southwesterly wind, 20 gusting to 40. So it's going to be a little bit breezier than today, but very, very, very nice. So as we uh, head into central, 20 degrees pretty much across the board, 18 there along the coast in Harbor Breton. And uh, for the Corner Brook area, about 18 degrees, 20 degrees in Humber Valley. So yeah, it's just looking like a fantastic day for everyone on the island. And as well for Labrador, 19 degrees in Happy Valley, Goose Bay, uh, Lab City, Churchill Falls, looking in the mid-teens there, but still uh, uh, some sunshine there. So we do have a system that will be moving through, bringing some rain to the island Tuesday night into Wednesday. Some people might say that rain is quite welcome right now, especially the gardeners and the farmers. So I'll have uh, those details coming up a bit later. Jeremy? Planting the seed, we know tomatoes, potatoes, and carrots all grow in our fine climate. Climate. Up next, we'll take a look at what other crops researchers are looking to grow right here.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The provincial government is trying to change the kinds of food that grows here. At a research station on the west coast, things like asparagus, kale and other cold crops are flourishing. Here and Now's Colleen Connors took a tour today and discovered how this local food can end up on your plate. This is the test field where researchers are growing several types of kale, corn, asparagus, and even kohlrabi. Kohlrabi is a, it's, it's a relative of the turnip. Uh, most of these plants are in the cabbage family. Um, kohlrabi tastes a little bit between like a radish and a broccoli. And it's growing well. Here at the Western Agriculture Center, with a close to $400,000 annual budget, staff have discovered what can grow in Newfoundland. This is producing food locally. This food that's produced here has been proven to be of higher nutritional value. It lasts longer uh, in your refrigerators. Today, officials with land resources showed off the new crops at a public announcement. We only grow 10% in this province of what we consume. We import 90%. With the hopes this food will end up in a grocery cart. This is the first step in getting farmers to adopt new crops and new technologies. So we demonstrate it here. We take it to farmers fields. Then is the next step. They will grow it on a larger agronomic scale and then they will make it available to the grocery stores or their home farmers markets. This, these sites, these fields are dispelling myths as to what it is that can happen in our province. Like wheat at this field in Pasadena. It all goes to Simmons Farms down the road for cattle feed. I realized that these crops are actually cool climate crops and we were able to grow these for quite some time. We just haven't. Now that the government is funding the harvest of many different types of vegetables, agriculture could change how we eat. The goal of these test fields and growing things like this beautiful winter wheat is to see what will do well here and what people will buy that is grown right here in this province so they don't have to depend on food coming in on the ferry. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Pasadena. Seven weeks ago on the Danforth, people were out enjoying a warm summer evening. Then shots rang out. Two dead, 13 wounded, including nursing student Daniel Kane, who ran to help with her boyfriend, who's originally from the Northern Peninsula. Ian Hannah Mansing spoke with her for this piece that ran on the National last night. No one expects to like go out on a Sunday night and then like have their life completely turned upside down. Like no one expects that. Um, like it was, it was just an ordinary day, really. And like, we hadn't planned to go there like like a week ahead of time. It was just we literally planned like hours before the event, like before the incident to go to that restaurant for my friend's birthday. You don't think when you hear sounds like that, that there are anything other than fireworks. Like I thought it was just fireworks. Basically, as soon as we step out, I made eye contact with who I didn't realize until moments later was a shooter because he immediately started shooting at us. And um, that's when I, once I saw the shots, like I turned and like I felt, like I felt the shot, like, um, and immediately my, my legs like buckled under me. I don't want to dwell on that night. Um, yeah. But if I can, I just want to ask you a couple of the questions about that night. For sure. One is, like seeing the gunman face to face. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a bit surreal because when I made eye contact with him, I mean, he didn't look like he was a shooter. He was standing calmly. He was looking in our direction and immediately like, um, you know, like his hands came up and he was shooting at us. Kane spent days in intensive care at St. Michael's Hospital, heavily sedated. The bullet hit her spine, then her stomach, before exiting her body. Somebody has to come in that room and tell you the extent of your injuries, including the possibility you might not walk again. Do you remember that moment? Um, yeah, that was a hard day. That was, um, 
because obviously you know prior to to the incident like I had all these ideas about like what I was going to do with my life and like what the next like five ten years were going to be it is going to be different a lot of people understandably have expressed their anger at the shooter but you may be surprised to hear how Kane feels about him I've um I guess I oh, like I, I feel comfortable disclosing this like I mean I've had a history of depression so I can relate to the feeling like that you don't like you don't feel like you can connect to other people or like you feel like um, like the world doesn't understand you or like you um, like feeling like a lot of pain and not knowing where to go or having feeling like you have no one to talk to I don't take it personally that that the shooter did this like I, I th I feel sorry for them. I wish that perhaps that they had the help that they needed. So you didn't go through a time when you were angry at him? Um, I've had moments, absolutely, where I did. Um, but I think that's normal. And um, I do, I think that's normal. After the Danforth shooting and so much other gun crime in Toronto this year, the mayor, John Tory, has called for a ban on handguns which Kane supports. I don't think the general public needs to have weapons. I mean, like in the hands of law enforcement, I think that's different. But in the hands of like, you know, lay people, I, I, don't, I don't think we're more safe. So I'd like to see them off the streets. I asked Kane about what seems like one of her most remarkable traits, how calm and accepting she is about what's happened to her. It's not just a mask I'm wearing or anything like I mean a lot of people have said to me you know they can't believe how well I'm taking everything but to me it's like I just I don't I've already suffered enough like I've suffered a lot you know like why make things worse by like deciding to be unhappy and deciding to be uh, to feel like you know like I was cheated out of a life that like this other kind of life like an able-bodied person's life like I mean I'm not I have been cheat like we like nothing has been guaranteed to us so There is a lot of work ahead. Two more months in this rehab facility, eventually continuing her studies as a nurse. Not exactly the life she was living two months ago, but as close, she vows, as she can make it. Incredible. That was the CBC's Ian Henneman saying now Danielle's story ran last night on The National. You wouldn't normally expect to see horses behind the walls at Her Majesty's Penitentiary, but earlier today, a literal horse pen went up in the prisoner's yard. We'll tell you why coming up next.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Newfoundland and Labrador has a new Chief Justice. Deborah Fry was sworn into the position this morning. Now, Chief Justice Fry first worked as a nurse before being called to the bar in 1981. During her career, she served the Crown, held the province's most senior public service position, and won the Queen's Jubilee Medal. In 2007, she was appointed to the bench as a Supreme Court Justice. And today, she became the first female Chief Justice to serve this province. The history of women uh, involved in the law and judiciary is not well known in our province. And as the first woman Chief Justice, and as a role model and mentor for young women and lawyers, I intend to ensure that more people come to know and understand the role and contribution of women to the development of the law and jurisprudence of this province. Well, you wouldn't normally expect to see horses behind the walls at Her Majesty's Penitentiary, but earlier today, a literal horse pen went up in the prisoner's yard. It's part of a new therapy program that aims to help inmates inside HMP dealing with mental health issues. Here now's Andrew Sampson prepared this look for us. We are the first in Canada to actually do a program like this inside of the prison. Uh, they do one similar in BC, but it's more of a horse husbandry program. This one is actual um, therapeutic value where we're working on people's addiction issues, we're working on their mental health issues, and helping move them forward. A lot of people think that they're coming to learn about horses and horse skills, but what they end up learning about is themselves. Um, and they don't even quite understand in the beginning how that's going to happen. But what happens is the horse lives in the moment. It is who it is all the time. It doesn't judge. And here we are inside a prison, so it's nice not to be judged. And we hear things like they want to build up their self-confidence or they want to work on their addictions issues. Um, they want to work on coping um, strategies for when they are released. So then we use the horses and observing the horses um, and exercises with them to put all that into motion. This is something that was completely their concept and we, we were just happy to allow it. It is the first of its kind in Canada that we're aware of. Uh, but I'm supportive of anything new and different that we think is going to help the individuals in here. We've had canine therapy, we've tried it, other different types of therapy. So when we have something like this, even me being down in my first time, just being around them, I can, I can see how relaxing it is myself. So I can only imagine the effect that it's having on the inmates to get to take part. Because at the end of the day, these individuals that are here, when they go back out, we need to do our best to help them rehabilitate and reintegrate into society. What a beautiful evening in St. John's. Clear skies. You can't complain. People will, but you can't. You know, it is, it is the 10th of September and it's very nice. We have more sunshine coming tomorrow.
Welcome back. Hey, yeah, welcome back there now. Sorry, I jumped, I jumped into it. A major storm is blowing towards the Atlantic coast of the United States. Hurricane Florence is currently about 1,000 kilometers southeast of Bermuda. And right now the storm is on track for an area from Georgia to Virginia. Florence was upgraded from a tropical storm yesterday and to a category four hurricane. Now winds have been clocked at 225 kilometers an hour. Wow, wow, wow. There are fears it could come ashore as a category four storm later this week. Now states of emergency have been put in place and evacuations are already underway in some areas. Yeah, so some pretty serious stuff for uh, the Certainly Carolinas is. and the east coast of, uh, of the states right now for sure. That's not very good. Yeah, I should mention actually an interesting note. Uh, Rodney Barney from Environment Canada uh, tweeted earlier today that uh, a side effect of this for us, because we're not, well, it's not looking we like we're going to feel any of this, but uh, the temperatures are bumping up later in the week into the 20s, so that could be a side effect of this. So. Well, it's a positive side effect yeah. for something that could be terrible. Well, let's have a look at uh, the weather forecast. Clear skies right now for satellite and radar shot. And this is Florence uh, in relation to the province right now. And just a quick look at the track that this will be taking uh, right now. So yeah, winds clocked at 220 kilometers an hour at the moment. A category four hurricane pushing through Tuesday, 250 kilometers an hour. And uh, then later on the week, yeah, it could look like it could hit uh, North and so South Carolina as a category four. So some pretty serious stuff uh, for that neck of the woods for sure. As for us, we are looking at a frost advisory for uh, tonight from the Deer Lake area, Burgio, Conegra, and uh, over to Bonavista and Gander. So if you're in those areas, you'll want to uh, take precautions if you have any frost sensitive plants for sure. So uh, overnight tonight, looking at mainly clear skies uh, on the island and in parts of Labrador through tomorrow, a little bit of cloud cover, but overall it's going to be a pretty sunny day for for most places. Temperatures on the island between 17 degrees and 20 degrees, so it's going to be a quite a nice day. Winds not too strong. Southwesterly winds 20 gusting to 40, so tomorrow is going to be just a lovely day. And for Labrador, a little bit cooler there in uh, the west, but Happy Valley Goose Bay and Cartwright looking at uh, upper teens for the temperature tomorrow. So Tuesday night, we do have this system moving through, bringing some rain starting on the west coast uh, late uh, Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. That's where it's going to start, and it's going to continue tracking eastwards uh, throughout Wednesday, hitting the Avalon Peninsula around Wednesday afternoon. Noon. So not too sure on totals for this system yet. There's some disagreement with the guidances, but uh, it looks like we could get a good dose of rain there. So yeah, this is the picture. Fairly warm temperatures as well. 17 degrees for the east, but 22 uh, for the west. And for Labrador, 24 degrees in the east, uh, sun and cloud, and 19 degrees for western Labrador there on Wednesday afternoon. So as we head into Thursday, Another great day for uh, for everyone on the island. Temperatures going back up into the 20s, 25 in central areas. And for Labrador, mainly cloudy skies expected there, but uh, 21 degrees there in the east. So not so bad. Here's a quick look at your five day forecast. So you can see the trends here. We're dipping down a little bit, going up to 20 degrees down then. But Saturday so far looking like 22 degrees for the east and a mix of sun and cloud for central areas looking at some cloud cover heading into the weekend, but still some nice temperatures into the 20s there for western Labrador sun and cloud on Saturday and 20 degrees as the high in Labrador looking at some showers heading into the weekend there, but temperatures still in the upper end of uh, the teens and for uh, western Labrador similar kind of story a bit warmer there on Friday, but temperatures dipping down on Saturday. So that's your forecast. Jeremy, back to you. Thanks, Carolyn. A group of fishermen in British Columbia has introduced a controversial plan they say will help the endangered whales in the coastal waters. The group wants to cull thousands of seals and sea lions who are competitors for the orca's food supply. Greg Rasmussen has the story. Beneath these waters, millions of migrating salmon are making their way upriver to spawn. Oop, there's a jumper right there. But their numbers have been falling. 
and some blame a fish-eating predator. We're looking at the harbor seals coming into the channel to rest. Ken Pierce says seal populations have boomed since hunting stopped in the 1970s. They're here because of all the sockeye salmon in the river right now. That's their food base. There are more than 100,000 harbor seals in BC waters, and his group estimates millions of salmon are being eaten by seals and sea lions. What do you want to do to the seals and sea lions? Bring them back into balance, back into historical balance over the last 50 years, which numbers... But that kill a bunch of them, essentially. Harvest. We have a market for it. He says the biggest obstacle to a hunt would be a large public backlash. Bet, yeah, they are cute. I'm the first to agree. But now, now see that 80,000. Are they cute anymore? No, they're a nuisance. I've always enjoyed fishing, especially hearing, but this is taking the fun right out of it. Here, sea lions swarm a commercial fishing net. You talk to anybody ourselves that have been in the business, anybody that's associated with and uh, Almost anger comes out when you start talking about that we can't get something done. The plight of BC's southern resident killer whales, which are endangered, could help their cause. The whales are in trouble in part due to a lack of their primary food, Chinook salmon. But scientists say killing seals and sea lions might not have much of an impact. I don't know if there's any good predator control study that's ever demonstrated that killing off a predator has actually led to more prey. Proponents of the hunt, though, say they're open to scientific study. We're, we're not talking about taking all the predators out. We're, take, we're talking about putting them in a balance, and that's, that's the difference. Do you think it's going to happen? Yep, absolutely. The group says it's continuing to build support and has a meeting later this month with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, on the Fraser River. Ontario Premier Doug Ford announced today he will invoke the notwithstanding clause in the charter for the first time in the province's history. Well, guess what? I'm going to use every tool at our disposal to make sure we hold up the Constitution and the democratic right of the people of Ontario. And I will not waver from representing the people. Ford is taking the unprecedented measure in order to pass legislation which an Ontario judge ruled this morning was unconstitutional. The judge said the proposed law limited the right to free expression by changing the size of Toronto City Council after the municipal election campaign had already started. The notwithstanding clause permits a government to override the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It has rarely been used since the Constitution was signed in 1982. Look at that. Yes, our viewer photo of the day. Isn't that stunning? I'm going to guess this was taken in Labrador. <laughs> going to go out on a limb. Pretty good guess. I'll narrow down the location uh, coming up after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. So the first ever Bon Rexton Grand Fondo is in the books. If you're wondering what a Grand <laughs> Fondo is, it's Italian, it just means big race. Okay. So it was the first ever one that they did uh, in the Bonavista Peninsula and more than 100 cyclists took part. So the fun bike ride took place on the Bonavista Peninsula on Saturday and Sunday. There was a 130 kilometer ride and then a shorter 50 meter, sorry, 50 kilometer, 50 meters wouldn't be much of a ride, 50 kilometer ride as well. Yeah, but it wasn't uh, just the grown-ups. Kids got in on the action with a shorter bike ride of their own. Based on the success of this version, there's already talk of doing it again next year. Nice that it went well. Wouldn't be for me. <laughs> 130 kilometers. So basically, you did, did a loop around the uh, the Bonavista Peninsula, and then the 50 kilometer ride was to go to uh, Catalina and back. Oh, it's a long haul. And then they did they partied at Port Rexton along the way. Now, if you have a weather picture that you'd like us to uh, to put on the air, you can send us. I, I think I'm reading your lines. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Not NL photo NL photos at cbc.ca and here is tonight's yes picture. isn't this just stunning you know now do you want can you tell me which part of Labrador well this was sent to us uh, from a gentleman in Lab City uh, so yeah Larry Jenkins sent this in I'm not entirely sure if this is actually Lab City uh, but he had Larry Jenkins Lab City there, so. Now, I, uh, I, spent, uh, I spent a year and a half in Lab City working for the Labrador West, sorry, working for the CBC, and I had the pleasure of seeing the Northern Lights on many occasions, and it is a very humbling experience. I bet. I've never seen it myself, but it's definitely on my bucket list of things that I want to see at some point in my life because it just looks amazing. Nature. Yeah. Nature, <laughs> weather, and people with their cameras today uh, are taking such good pictures. So yeah, if you do have any photos, it's nlphotos at cbc.ca. That's it for us. Have a great night, everyone. We'll be back doing this all again tomorrow.